We want to continue along the theme that we have been looking at in terms of the will of God. Several of you have been with us over the last couple of weeks uh, as we are talking about getting to know the will of God, getting to understand what is God's will, right? Not just specifically what is God's will for me, but we're looking at the general perspective of God's will, trying our best to understand what really does the scripture point to when he's talking about the will of God. We said that the will of God is that which God wishes or has determined to be done, that which God desires we would do. When we talk about the will of God, we're talking about that which God wished to be done. That's what God desired. That's his will. And we want to be able to be in that. Whatsoever is God's desire, we want to be able to see that being fulfilled. When we talk about the will of God, we're talking about the God's sovereign will. We also refer to his perfect will. Many times you hear that being made mention, God's sovereign will, his perfect will, and his permissive will. Okay, But in essence, we know that what God has said to us right, is that he desires. Christ himself said that God desires to give you the kingdom. He delights, he's pleased for you to have the kingdom. So when we're talking about his will, one of the most important and prevalent um, aspects of his will is for us to enter into the kingdom of God. That's his desire. And Christ has provided the keys for us to get into the kingdom. He says, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom, right? And we also now know that we have to accept the provisions that God has made for us to enter into his kingdom. So if it is that he desires that we enter in and he has made provision, all we have to do is to accept what he has done. And that's important for us to do. We said that the will of God, uh, we saw a threefold perspective of the will of God, our salvation, our sanctification, and our resurrection. We recognize that God desires for us to be saved. It is his will that you are saved. It is his will that you are sanctified. And it is his will that at the end of time, you're going to be resurrected. Amen? That's his will for us. The word of God declares, Jesus himself says that what he wants to do is that, uh, that those who believe in him, he will raise up in the last day. Amen? So now we also understand that while we talk about the will of God, here Jesus is saying, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So not everybody who say, Lord, Lord, we established last day that just confessing Lord and and declaring the Lordship of Jesus Christ is not going to guarantee you access to the kingdom. And not because you do signs and wonders, you perform miracles and you do signs and wonders, that's not going to guarantee you access to the kingdom either. And we establish it's not even going to guarantee that you have kingdom authority. Because he says that if it is that you do that, many will come in that day and say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And I will say of them, depart from me. I never knew you. He that worketh iniquity. So it is not that. So what we realize is this, that there is a need for us to do the will. He says that, but he that do, does the will of my Father, that's who will enter into the kingdom. He that does what? Does the will of my Father. So which means, if he's telling us that it is he that does the will, which means the will of God, the will of God can be done. Okay? The will of God can be done. We are saying that he that does the will is the one who's going to enter in. It means that we have to do the will. So it's not just knowing God's will. There is some active involvement that we need to do. We need to do that which is the will of God. Amen? So if we must do the will of God, if the will of God can be done, we need to know what is required of us to do. Amen? So that we have a to-do list (laughs) that we are working with, as it were, in terms of the will of God. We have to do certain things. So the question we asked last day is, what must I do to fulfill the will of God? What is required of me in order to fulfill the will of God? And we said that it's necessary for us, in order to fulfill the will of God, we need to accept Christ. We need to do what? 
And last day, we started talking about this whole perspective of what it really means to accept Christ. And we, got, we touched on that last day. In fact, we were supposed to have completed it last day. We're going to complete it today by the grace of God. Amen? We said also in order to do what is required of us to do, we must accept Christ. We must repent of our sins. We must obey God's word. And we must humbly submit to God. So we said it's necessary to accept Christ. That's necessary for us in order to do God's will. When we talk about accept Christ, right, we are talking about accept him, accept his message, and accept his work. We want to accept him, his person, the person of Christ. We need to accept his message. What is it that he has taught us? Because many times what we have done is that some people have rejected the message of Christ and has relegated it to Old Testament concepts. So that because the, 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 the teachings of Christ came before Pentecost, some are of the belief that we are not to follow the teachings of Christ, but we have to follow the teachings from Acts go forward. And that's not the case. We have to be able to realize that what Christ did and what he taught was in preparation for acts going forward. So that we as the church have taught. So what the apostles taught were actually Christ's teachings. So that the teachings that the apostles had from Acts chapter 2 move forward, what is referred to as the apostles' doctrine is what they received from Christ. They believed in the message of Christ. They held on to the message of Christ and they taught the message of Christ. So when we now on this side of the 21st century are looking for, uh, at it, we must realize that what the gospel writers taught, what the apostles taught, were not contrary to what Christ taught. So while some people will want to hang up on certain pet theological terms and pet theological um, 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 uh, theories and hold that as their major doctrine, we have to be able to recognize that what Christ taught was not just my convenient to my religion. What he taught was his word that is necessary to bring us into the kingdom of God. And that's what the disciples taught. That's what the, 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 the believers taught. So that if we, as believers, we hold, we accept this what Christ is teaching, then we're going to be able to move forward. Amen? Hallelujah. So we accept. All right? So to accept, we understand that to accept is to believe or to come to recognize as valid or correct. When you accept something, you believe it. If I tell you certain things, if I tell you that I am going to come here at 10 o'clock uh, and have service from 10 o'clock, you're going to believe at 10 o'clock there's going to be service. So you accept that. If it is that the prime minister tell you certain restrictions are lifted, we believe that. <laughs> we accept that as truth, not so? So we believe that. So we recognize as valid and correct. That's what it means to accept. So we also, to accept also means to believe that something is true. So when we talk about accepting Christ, we believe that he is valid and correct. We believe that his teachings are valid and correct. We believe that his sacrifice was valid and correct. We believe in him to be the true one, the true Messiah, the only one who was given by God to bring the redemption of mankind. We believe, we accept that to be true. So we accept him. We accept his, him in terms of his person. We accept his message and we accept his sacrifice, his finished work. We believe this. And as believers, you know why they call you believers? Because you've got to believe. <laughs> you understand? If you don't believe, then you're not believer. You're a doubter. And true Christianity... Is about our faith in God through the person of Christ Jesus. So if we don't believe, then hear this, hold on. You're not a Christian. <laughs> oh my gosh. Somebody say you're Christophine, not a Christian. <laughs> 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 
So we realize, brothers and sisters, there's a need to believe. And what do we believe? We believe in the person of Christ Jesus. We believe in his message. And we believe in the work that he has come to do. That's what we believe. So we believe that Christ is true. We believe that his message is true. And we believe that his work on the cross was a final and complete work. I be- that's what I believe. The question may be, what do you believe? Amen? Right? So we accept the person of Christ Jesus. Last day we, we spoke about the person and we asked the question, when we talk about the person of Christ Jesus, we ask a, a very important question. Who do you say that I am? What's your perspective of the person of Christ Jesus? Who do you say he is? Right? Many people will have different options, different opinions on the person of Christ and who he is is, right? We recognize that Christ is the promised Messiah. Who is he? He is the promised Messiah. The, since uh, the time of uh, Adam and Eve sinned, God promised that the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent so that the, from the time that man sinned, there was a provision that a Messiah will come to bring forth the freedom and the liberty from sin. That's the promised Messiah. We believe that he is the promised Messiah. We believe that he is the son of God. The son of God. That talks about him coming in the person of God. In fact, we're going to get to that next point, but the son of God talks about him sharing the divine nature of his father. When the Jews heard him say that God is his father and recognized that he was claiming to be the son of God, they picked up stones and they wanted to stone him for blasphemy. Why? Because he says, you are a man and you're calling God your father, so you're making yourself what? Equal to God. It's not that he was making himself equal to God. He was already there with God at the beginning in the name of Jesus. He is the eternal son of God. My God. So when we have this baby being born and celebrated at Christmas time, that's not the birth of the Son of God. That's not the beginning time of the Son of God. He was there from eternity past, brothers and sisters. So 2,000 years ago, he came into the earth. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The child was born, the Son of God was given to humanity. He wasn't born. He also is the Savior of the world. The Jews understood the Messiah coming, but the Gentiles did not have a promised Messiah. But Christ still came, and the purpose for Christ's coming was not for the Jews and, uh, alone, but it was for the Jews and the Gentiles. He came as Savior of the world. And we're going to be touching about that perspective of him being the Savior of the world, because in order for him to save the world, he had to make a sacrifice. And he came as God in flesh. Woo! And this one is where a lot of people stumble. Because many uh, 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 outside of Christianity, there's hardly any other person. In fact, there's no other religion or no other faith that will believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Because they have not accepted. Islam rejected. Hinduism rejected. Everybody will, will uh, Jew, even the Jewish faith rejected. Because they don't recognize Christ. But when you read the scripture, you realize that he says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him, without him was not made anything that was made. In him was life. And, it, and, and this life was the light of men. And then later on in verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten son of God. So the word of God declares that the word that was with God in the beginning, that word became flesh and dwelt among us and we were able to see his glory. Man was able to look upon the son of God coming in person as God himself in the earth and people were able to look upon his glory, the glory as of the only begotten son of God. So we recognize when we talk about our belief in the person of Christ Jesus, these are four cardinal things we got to believe. And there are many Christians who live their entire Christian life not even knowing this, far more believing it. So then what then is our Christianity based on? I just go to church. What? For what? 
I don't know. I just, I just like to go to, I like how pastor is preach. Then what are you preaching about? Somebody tell me he's not preaching about Christ. Because if he's preaching about Christ, you've got to know that he's the Messiah. You've got to know that he's the son of God. You've got to know that he's the savior of the world. And you've got to know that he's God in flesh. What do you believe? We've got to accept the person of Christ Jesus. We established last day we got to accept the teachings of Christ Jesus. Christ had a simple yet profound message. And his message was really um, authoritative, foundational, and uh, spiritual, and transformative. When you look at what Christ did, right, the message, when he came to teach, his teachings were authoritative. He spoke as one having authority, and not like the Jews, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. His teachings were, were foundational. If you build your life, if you hold to the teachings, this is the foundation upon which we build our life. Amen? The words he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So his teachings are spiritual. That which we are receiving from Christ's word, it can bring life to your spirit. It is only spirit can give life to spirit. And the word of God is transformational. Amen? That's the text that we have. The, when you open the scriptures, if you study the teachings of Christ, your life cannot be the same. Amen. There are people who will read the Bible, but you ain't studying it to show yourself approved unto God. You're not making every effort to do that which is right in the eyes of God. If we follow the instructions of scripture, your life bound to change. We cannot stay the same way that we have been all the time if we are studying the, the text of Scripture. Never, never, never. And now our focus today is on the finished work of Calvary. All that we looked at last day, but today we are looking at the finished work. we got to accept the finished work. What did Christ do for you? He worked a work, a wonderful work. And we have to be able to accept, to believe this work that was done. Hallelujah. Go to, uh, with me to John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do what? The will of him that sent me and do what? So he's saying, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to? And to what? And to what? Christ didn't come to start a walk. <laughs> I don't know if you get what I'm saying. There are some people who start a work, but they don't finish it. Christ says, my meat, my sustenance, the things that bring satisfaction to me is to do the will of him that sent me and to what? Finish his work. So God has given the, the son, the father has given the son a particular assignment. And the son's delight is to finish that which the father has sent him to do. It is not just starting what he sent him to do, but to be able to finish it. In John chapter 17, in John chapter 17, uh, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth and have what? Finish the work which thou givest me to do. Now this is what is referred to, uh, this is part of what is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. The whole of John chapter 17 is a prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And here in it, in verse 4, he's saying now that I have glorified thee on the earth and I have finished the work that thou hast given me to do. Now hear this. This is the night before he was crucified. So which means at this time, the work of Calvary was not yet completed. But yet, Christ accounted it as being completed because he had already committed himself to the entire work that is being done. So at this time, after this prayer, you would have seen a sequence of events. Judas would have come in and pointed the guards to him. He, they would have arrested him. He would have gone on trial, and then he would have actually been crucified. So from here on, after the prayer, was just uh, uh, leading down to the execution of Christ Jesus. And what he said is this. At this time, in his prayer, I have finished the work. You know why? 
Because already he had concluded in his heart that this work is done. And if you get what I'm saying to us, it's already done. And we have to be able to understand that when we are walking in God's will, we have to be able to accept that God's will is being done. I have already committed myself to do the work of God. And I'm not turning back. So it's done. It's finished. It's not like somebody tell you to do something. It's done already. And then start yet. I tell, I tell my wife, anytime somebody tell you, don't worry. <laughs> that is the time to worry. So you go and buy the mechanic, he say, no, 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 it's done already, man. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. God, start looking for the next mechanic. Because that is the time to worry. Some people like that. But when Christ say it finish, it finish. So all that had to be now is the manifestation of the finished work. In fact, I will tell you this. Before the foundation of the world, it was already finished. <laughs> Before the foundation of the world, it was already completed. And you know what that means? Before Adam sinned, it was already done. So Adam sinned didn't catch God by surprise and now, you know, this is a backup plan that God made. No, 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 no. What Adam did, God already provided for it before the foundation of the earth. So when he says it was finished, the manifestation of it is what is outstanding now, and he was about to do it. So let's see how it's done. In John chapter 19, right, and you can turn with me to this one, and we're going to take it up from verse 28. He says, after this... Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. So Jesus, knowing what? That all things were now accomplished. His work that he had come to do was completed. By this time, he's nailed upon the cross. He already got the crown of thorns. They already beat him. You understand? So he was waiting there now, nailed upon the cross. And he says now, he know everything had been accomplished. And now he says, I thirst. And of course, that was in line with Psalm 69, 21, that actually um, was a messianic prophecy concerning him actually eating of gall and drinking of vinegar. Verse 29, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is, it is, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So Jesus, the final statement that he made, in this account, is that it is finished. What did he do? He died. <laughs> so just before he gave up the spirit, gave up the ghost, just before he died on the cross, he said it is finished. Why could he have said it was finished? Verse 28. All things had been accomplished. He was now sacrificed. He is now being sacrificed. And this was the last part that was necessary. After he brought man to recognize the, that the, the father, after he opened man's eyes to the truth as to what the, the word of God says, what the father intends for him, after they recognized that he is the Messiah that had to come, he had to die. Because without death, there's no sacrifice for sin being paid. And he had to do that. And some people say, well, God could have made another way. He could have if he wanted to. But based on his own judicial system, a price had to be paid. 
Amen? So God will save. God will was to save, sanctify, and to raise up. So God's intention is to make sure that man is saved, man is sanctified, and man is raised up. That's what, and this is what the cross, the crucifixion did. That through the crucifixion, God saved man. Through the crucifixion, man can be sanctified. And through the crucifixion and the subsequent resurrection, man can be raised up from the dead. So when we talk about what do we believe about the work of Christ, we got to believe that that work was done for me to be saved, sanctified, and to be resurrected. You see, at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, the salvation is, uh, the, the work that Jesus did brought our salvation. His sanctification, uh, our sanctification um, was, was done by Christ performing this particular task that brought into effect our sanctification. And this resurrection, my God, we're going to experience it later on. Right? So you'll hold on for that one. Amen? Now, through his death, and resurrection, the redemptive purpose of Christ has been filled, fulfilled. Now we're going to talk about a very important term that is called redemption. Now, when we think about redemption, a lot of times we think about it from the perspective of, and I myself shared it from the perspective of going and redeem your jewelry that was pawn. Anybody ever pawn? Any, don't put up your hand. But you have a, a nice piece of a gold, a nice piece of jewelry, and you're going to some hard times or whatever as the case may be, and you decide that you want to pawn it. You don't want to sell it. You just pawn it. You go down by Mirage, and you tell them that you need to get a money. <laughs> and you give them it. They give you a notice, a note, and they give you some money, and then you have a specific time to come back to do what? Redeem it. And if it is that you don't come back within that time, you have forfeited the redemption period. So then marriage will make a list, and they will sell your jewelry to somebody else. Not so? That's what we normally could. But I want to take the redemption perspective a little further. Because when we talk about the sacrifice of Christ and the redemption that we have, it is not just about going and redeem jewelry. But the picture becomes a little more vivid because it's going to redeem a slave that has been sold into slavery. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. So man is held captive, then we are called slaves to sin. Now let's see how this is practical. For all of us, we are living our lives, and for many of us, we tend to do things we don't want to do. Sinful things that we tend to have sometimes a little excitement to do it, but then you realize that this is not pleasing to God. And you're trying your best to live right, but somehow or the other, in spite of the fact that you are trying to live right, you always find yourself going back into the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. It seems as though this thing controls you. Not so? And the reason why you feel as it controls you, as though it controls you, is because it does control you. And that's why we talk about us being bound to do this. We are bound to sin. We are in bondage to sin. So when someone is sold into slavery, you'll realize that the slave follows the master's orders. And even though you don't want to follow the master's orders, you say, yes, master. And you do exactly what he says. Not so. So really, deep down within, you're eating up yourself, you know. But yes, master. Yeah. And you're grumbling after, but yes, master. And if you're a good slave, you do it with a smile. And you serve your master well. You shine master's shoes. And you comb master wife here. 
and you feed master baby, not so? And you do it with a nice heart, and that's how some of us live in sin. That's how we do it. Not so? Deep down, we are under captivity. We are bound. And the bad thing about it is the, the critical deception is this. There are many people who were under slavery when we had the transatlantic um, slave trade, when Africans were in slave trade. There were many people who were under slavery and didn't even think that they were in slavery. You know why? Because they were born into slavery. This is all they knew. And for us, our life is a similar way. We were born into sin, so all we know is a sinful life. All we know is how to do wrong. So now when somebody come and tell you, you can be free, what is freedom? When somebody come and tell you that Jesus paid the price, what does that mean? We can't understand it because even though our price has been paid, we're still going back on the plantation. The emancipation proclamation was made, but we are still going back on it. You know why? That's all we know. And when Christ, what he did is that he came to bring forth redemption. So that what we have been sold into, he has made provision for us to come out. The shackles that are on our feet has been broken. So that we can now be free. Christ's sacrifice, brothers and sisters was a full and complete payment for our sins. So what does it mean? It means that this slave went on the auction block. I've been working hard. I've been doing all that I wanted to do. I've been living for my master who was sin. That's who I was. And I went on the auction block. And Christ came. And he said, you see, that one, I want that one. He looked at me and he said, come. And what he did, he paid the price for my freedom. He paid the price for me to be set free. And in 1993, September 12th, 1993, I was made free. On September 12th, 1993. What does he say? In Galatians chapter 3. Christ hath what? Redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for... So he redeemed us. Who redeemed us? Who paid the price? He redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. So he bought our price. Now what does it mean to be redeemed from the curse of the law? The curse of the law is that the laws of God was given to humanity, to the Jewish people in particular. And he gave... Some of you all may not know this, but it wasn't just 10 commandments that were given. It was 613 commandments. The 10 commandments that were written on stone was a representative of the broader law of God. And if you understand what I mean. So when we talk about the law of God, we are not just talking about the 10 commandments. And no, take note of this word, a word decalogue, decalogue. Deca from decimal and log from word or logos. So what does decalogue mean? Anytime you hear anybody refer to decalogue, you go into Covenant Life Transformation Ministries, don't look like you're blank. <laughs> when you hear the term decalogue, they are talking about the Ten Commandments. Amen? Deca from decimal, decimal from ten. So decalogue is referred to as the Ten Commandments. 
What is Decalogue? <laughs> Good. So, the law is not just the Decalogue alone. The law is the entire, if you look at the commandments of God, 613. If you go through the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to get the laws of God. Now, what was the curse of the law? The curse of the law was the reality that if you break one law, you break all. So that if it is that you are saying that you are doing the law. So for example, one of the laws was that I must not cuss. Sorry, that was one of the laws. <laughs> one of the laws was that I must not commit adultery. Or I must not murder. But if you don't murder or you don't commit adultery, but you're bearing false witness, you still broke the entire law. And if you understand what I'm saying to us. So what he is saying is this, that if you break one, you have broken the law. So the entire law was broken. And the bad thing about it is this, that man in his humanness could not have kept all the law. So that the curse of the law was this. Man was unable to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. And because of that, he was found guilty of breaking the law because he could not have satisfied the requirements of the law. So what did Christ do? Christ come to redeem us from what? That curse. So that even though in my natural state, I cannot fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, what happens is that Christ's righteousness is now imputed upon me. Because I have accepted him. Because I believe in him. So that he now bears the curse that was upon me. You see, because man is sinful by nature, man by nature cannot keep the law. That's the nature. So you were born with a problem. I wonder if you understand. Don't blame your parents. That's not where the problem began. Blame Adam. I always tell people, if I only lay hands on Adam, God help me to forgive. But he's the reason why we're in all this trouble. So Christ has redeemed us from what? The curse of the law. Go to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5. But when, read it for me. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born, made of a woman, made under the law. <coughs> to do what? To, to do what? To, to redeem them that were. Under the law. That we might receive what? The adoption of sons. So Christ came and he was born under the law. What does it mean he was born under the law? Christ was born in the Jew Jewish system. Don't let nobody deceive you otherwise. He was born of a Jewish, he was born and came into a Jewish family, amen? So for, one to, for simplicity, he was born a Jew. Is that okay? So he was born under the law. The legal system was given to the Jewish people and he was born under that law so that he is going to do what? Redeem them that were what? Under the law. That we <laughs> might receive what? The adoption of sons. So that we can now become children of God by adoption. Why? Because of what Christ did. So now I was a slave. And now I am being adopted by Christ Jesus. <laughs> you didn't get that. You see, you don't know about slavery. You understand? We don't know about that. Because if we know that, you will understand how significant it is. Somebody who had no, no sort of legal rights. Somebody who owned nothing. Someone who was owned by somebody else is now being adopted into a family. Now having a sense of belonging that God is my father. That's powerful. To know that I am moving from slavery to childhood. From slavery to sonship. That's powerful. So he's saying here now that we might have it. What brought that? The redemption. 
the work of Christ on Calvary. So we realize that those who were born under the law receive redemption as sonship. But then, remember we said that Christ came to save whom? The world, not just Jews. And it is in him we have what? Redemption, how? His through his? Blood. Through his what? Blood. So when we talk about, oh, the blood of Jesus, it is because that blood was shed to bring my redemption. So when we talk about the blood and we take in communion, it is because we understand the redemptive power that is in the blood of Christ Jesus. So many times we talk about plead the blood, plead the blood. It is about us understanding the redemption power to work in us. That's to go beyond just our religious um, kind of jargon and things like that. You could plead the blood how much you want. If you don't understand what Christ's blood do to bring forth your, free, to bring forth your freedom and, your, your, uh, and to break you out of bondage to sin, you could plead the blood how much you could get plead it till you're blue in your face. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. It's not about pleading. It's about being under that blood. Being able to recognize the power, the, re the detergent power of the blood. Amen. To cleanse you of all unrighteousness and to bring you into a newness of life. Look what he says. In whom we have what? Redemption through the blood. What happens after that? The? You know how much people, they, they, they in all kind of sin, but I plead the blood, plead the blood, plead the blood, plead the blood, plead the blood. And their life wrapped up in all type of sin. Why? Because we see things as a religious thing. It's religious. The blood brings what? Forgiveness of sins. You want to plead it? Surrender to God and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. That's what it's about. According to the riches of his what? Hmm. So when we talk about this, you see why it is in my life I can shout freedom because of the fact that what Christ has done for me is not something I could have done for myself. Hmm? What he has done for me was he break the shackles. Freedom has come. And if you understand the freedom that you are living in, brothers and sisters, based on what Christ has done, we're not going to go back to the old self. Why? Because he has already broke me free. Broke me free from what? From slavery. So that I am no longer under slavery. I accept the emancipation proclamation of Christ Jesus. I accept that. So I am free. And the word of God tells me who the son sets free is what? Free indeed. So I am really free if Christ has made me free. I'm not free if I just mount in freedom. So what is it? So that Christ sets you free. So that you are what? Free indeed. So it means that what did Christ come to set you free from? Bondage to sin. So if Christ set you free from bondage to sin, you are free indeed. But if we are still under the bondage to sin, then we have not accepted the freedom that Christ brought. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying to us. Because there are some people who believe that because you have grace, you could still live in sin. And the grace covers you. And that's a deception, you know. <laughs> that is a big setup. Because there are some people who's going to kick hell's door wide open because they are deceived to think that because I live under the grace of God, I can do whatever, and God's grace covers me. That's a deception. So our freedom has come through the redemptive work of Christ. So when we talk about the work of Christ, the work that God has done through the person of Christ, it brings redemption, and that redemption means that I am free. Amen? The work that Christ did was a substitutionary sacrifice. Long ago, there was a sacrificial system that was in place. So that when someone sinned, every year they needed to do what is referred to as a sin offering. And they had to bring a, an animal, a sheep or a goat 
or a cow to sacrifice to cover their sin. So the lamb, when the blood of the lamb was shed, it would have been sprinkled on the people. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. That lamb represented you. It represented the people who sinned. There was another concept that was called the scapegoat offering. And you would have to put your hand on the goat, <laughs> right? And you claim that that is you. And <laughs> we understand with the sacrifice of Christ, brothers and sisters, that all of these type of blood offerings were no longer required after him because of the fact that he was the last blood sacrifice to be offered. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. When Christ came, the death that Christ died, we need to understand that that was your place that he took. You and I have been in sin. And there is one judgment, one just judgment for sin. What's that? Death. The soul that sins shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. So that what we have is that when Christ died, he took our place that we deserve to die. But Christ died in our place. That is what is referred to as the substitutionary sacrifice. Or some refer to it as substitutionary atonement. So that on the day of atonement, the Jewish people understood that was the day that sin offering was made. And so what we have here now in the person of Christ or the work of Christ was a substitutionary atonement where Christ is being put to death for me and for you. I wonder if you understand what. Now, if we don't accept that, you remember we're talking about receiving and believing, not so? If we don't accept and believe that, we will think that we still have to pay individually for our own sins. But if we understand that, then we will allow the transfer to take place. I call it the great exchange. What do I mean by the great exchange? God takes my sins and put it on Christ. And he takes Christ's righteousness and put it on me. Jesus! Anytime I think about that great exchange, I feel excited. You know why? Because I didn't deserve it. But he didn't deserve it. What he didn't deserve? He didn't deserve to die. I deserve to die. But there's this exchange that took place where he took Christ's righteousness and put it on me. And he took my sinfulness and put it on Christ. So he bore my sins so I can receive his righteousness. And there are people who don't appreciate that. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. We got to accept that. If you get that opportunity, won't you accept that? If you were found guilty of a capital offense and they sentence you, they condemn you, they sentence you to die and somebody else comes in and pays that death penalty for you, wouldn't you be grateful? Will you still go back and do the same capital offense? Why not? Because you appreciate the sacrifice that was made. And this is what the word of God brings us to. When we understand and we believe in the substitutionary work of Christ on Calvary, our appreciation, our belief, our acceptance of this prompts us now to walk in righteousness and truth. Because we understand what Christ did for us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 11. But Christ... Being an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained what? Eternal redemption for whom? For whom? For if... 
the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who uh, through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from what? Dead works to serve the living God. And for, the, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, that, with, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Let's stop there before we jump to 22. What he's given us the understanding here is this, brothers and sisters, that Christ was the one who was made a high priest. And he says that in the Old Testament, in the Old System, the, bloods of, the blood of goats and, and cows and things was sprinkled on people and that sanctified them under that Old System. So he says, if it did that under that old system, how much more precious as it were, there's the blood of Jesus that is being sprinkled upon our heart that will cleanse and purge our conscience. So if those animals, the blood of those animals could have brought sanctification to a people under that system, how much more the blood of Christ Jesus under this new system. This is what he's saying. So, his, so Christ now, the, those priests in those days, they took the blood of goats and they took the blood of cows into the holies of holies, into the most holy place. But when Christ went, he went with his own blood. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. He took his own blood and presented it for our redemption. You want to know what to believe about the work of Christ Jesus? we got to believe that he presented his blood for our redemption. we got to know that, brothers and sisters, that the sacrifice of Christ, this is why it is get a little, a little tizzic when we deal with our religious folks and all that we want to do and how we just take our religious thing over the board. Because when you understand the nature of the sacrifice and the shedding blood of Calvary, it is more than just our religious lingo you realize that what he did is that he brought redemption through his blood. Those things that took place in the Old Testament, they were types, they were shadows of a greater significance that was to come. Jesus. So we understand that the blood was shed and Christ was this high priest we recognize also that those high priests would have gone in every year to do this. But let's see. Go to verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So you realize, brothers and sisters, that the tabernacle and the temple were really made as a pattern of heavenly things. This is important for us to understand because there are some people who stick with the temple and the tabernacle, not understanding that their role was really to show as a pattern of things to come, not an anchor for our salvation. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So while we appreciate our Jewish heritage as Christians and our Jewish lineage, we have to understand where it stops. Because our effort is not to go back to Judaism, it's not to go back to temple worship. We have to understand that we are brought out of that onto a living hope that is different from that. That was a pattern of things to come. And it was a pattern of higher things that existed. 
So that when we talk about the sacrifice and the, the blood that was used there being brought into the holies of holies, it was really to set us up for another sacrifice that is going to enter into the true holies of holies, that which is Christ's blood going into heaven on our behalf. So he now stands there on our behalf, in the presence of God, on your behalf and mine. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now what? Once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of what? himself and as it is appointed unto man once to die after this the judgment so Christ once was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation that's a wonderful promise so all through the years the Jewish people had to go in over and over and over to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. But Christ, once and for all. If we had to go back to that system, he would have had to be here to die over and over and over. And for heaven's sake, people, don't put the Lord on a cross every Easter. Come on. <laughs> Don't, we don't have to reenact that every Easter. Why? Because it was already finished. So you don't have to have him nailed up on the cross and people in, 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 in the Philippines going through and they nailing themselves on the cross. And No, no, we don't need that. Amen? What he says to do is to bring to, to remembrance what he was done. He tells us how to remember it. How? That's what we just read from the scriptures. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So what was given to remember the sacrifice is not a reenactment of it, but a, re a, a, a remembering through the communion table. That's how he says we ought to remember it. Once and for all. He once offered to bear the sins of many. So the sacrifice of Christ, brothers and sisters, is necessary for us to remember. The blood that was shed is necessary for us to remember. When we say we accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, it's because we accept the sacrifice that he has brought to save us. We accept the truth that he was a... He had a you're getting a lot of big words today, right? He was the propitiation right, for our sins. And that he was made the sacrifice in our place. His, he paid the price. He was the atoning sacrifice for us. So Jesus being Savior relates to him being sacrificed for our sins. His death on the cross was a substitute for our sins. And he became that propitiation, that sin offering for us. Amen? Uh, let's look at a couple of other scriptures. Romans chapter 3. And we're going to read it from 20 to 26. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. Now, does that mean that we break the law? No, we don't break the law. But we have to be able to understand, and probably I'll do a teaching on the Sabbath. And have I ever done a teaching on the Sabbath? Yeah? In Bible study? Right, in Bible study, but not in church, right? So one of these days we're going to do a, 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 a teaching on that, because a lot of people feel that you need to keep the Sabbath in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And some people think that you have to, uh, um, you are judged by the law, and we are not judged by the law. Why? Because it says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be what? Justified in the sight of God. So it is not doing the law that brings justification. And just for clarity, right, I know we're going to touch on it, but this Sunday is not the Sabbath. If you decide to keep the Sabbath, it's not a Sunday. The Sabbath is the seventh day. So if you decide, it's not to be a legal requirement, but if you decide that you want to make it a legal requirement, you can't say, okay, well, Sunday is my Sabbath. No, Sunday is the first day of the week. It's the Lord's day. 
I don't know if you understand the difference. <laughs> you see, there are lots of people who want to keep the law, but then they want to justify the keeping of the law in their own convenience. But we have to be careful. It's either we're under the law or we're not under the law. And if we're not under the law, then we are not required. The law is not required for us. Hmm. We need to have that teaching. Somebody say yes, sir. <laughs> but it's important for us to know that we are not justified by the law. Does it mean that we have no law? Yes, we do have a law. Right? So that there is a concept that is called antinomianism, which is those people who don't believe that there is any law. That we do live under a law, but it's a law of grace. It's a law of the spirit and life through Christ Jesus. That's the law that we live under. We don't live under the, 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 the legal system. Those 613 laws that were given to Israel are not applicable to us on this side of Calvary. Amen? So what do we have? We have the law of the spirit of grace. Right? We have the law of the spirit of life. When you look at Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk by the spirit and not after the flesh. And when you look at that, he says that, is, that, that we are under uh, this law of spirit and life. So, so that's what we are under. Amen? So that therefore, the, by the deeds of the law, the, uh, no man is justified. Are we justified by the deeds of the law? The word justified means to be made righteous. Are we made righteous by the law? No. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and by the prophets. Look what he goes on to say. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of what? Jesus Christ unto all them that so we now re-enter into the righteousness. How do we get righteousness? Is it by the law? No. But righteousness comes by what? Faith of Jesus Christ unto all, upon all, and up, what? Unto all, and upon all them that what? So you see why I am teaching you to believe in Christ Jesus? Why? Because it is only in your faith in Jesus Christ that you can receive the righteousness of God. You cannot be righteous in your own works and the works of the law. You could keep all the law like the scribes and the Pharisees and the, well, they didn't really keep all the law because that's the curse of the law. And that's the reality. But what we need to do is to come under Christ Jesus. And the belief in Christ Jesus is what brings the difference, what makes the difference, right? So, so look what he says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through what? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God hath set forth to be the propitiation, there's that word again, through faith in what? So we having faith in his blood is what makes his blood payment for our sins. I need to deal with this here. Get this, right? Christ died for the world, right? Do we believe that? He came to save the entire world. Is the entire world saved? No. Why not? Not everybody believe. Not everybody have accepted. Not everybody knows that this sacrifice that Christ made was for my sins. So my sins being, um, being, um, being carried by Christ Jesus has to be known by me and it has to be accepted by me. It is only with Christ taking my sins that I can be counted as the redeemed of God. Verse 26, to declare I say at this time, his righteousness, that he, might be, he, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe it in Jesus Christ. Are we to believe in Christ Jesus? When we believe, we accept as truth what Christ has done. And when we accept as truth what Christ has done, we can have this testimony concerning our sins. Say it for me. The sacrifice of Christ has caused my sins to be paid in full. Amen? Amen? 
Now, Christ's sacrifice on Calvary accomplished our complete salvation. And what does that mean? So we talk about his sacrifice. We talk about the fact that, uh, that his death, his work was a substitutionary work for us. But we need to also understand what happened as a result of that sacrifice. Yes, we have been saved. But what else took place? It's very important to understand this next part. Because if we miss this next part, our salvation is going to be incomplete. So our salvation is that God delivered us from our sins. We are free from our sins. And as a result of that, we are reconciled with God. We are what? Reconciled with God. Reconciled is a very interesting word. It means to be joined again. It means to come back in union with. So you fall out with somebody and you reconcile with them. The reality is this, brothers and sisters, we had fallen out of grace with God. We were out of this relationship with God. And now, because of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, we have been reconciled with him. Look what he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. He says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by what? The death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be what? Saved by his life. So now, when we were dead in trespasses, our acceptance of Christ caused us to be reconciled with God. So now, because we have been reconciled with God, we shall be saved by his life. So we understand that the death of Christ brought our reconciliation, but the resurrection of Christ is what brings our salvation. Read what reconcile is. To reconcile is to change from enmity to friendship. A change from a state of enmity and fragmentation to one of what? Harmony and fellowship. It's the restoration of friendly, cordial relations. So we now are reconciled to have friendly, cordial relations with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, he says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by what? Christ Jesus, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. We cannot be reconciled to God except through Christ Jesus. No matter what religion you do, no matter what religious act you do, you cannot come and be joined back with God except through Christ Jesus. It is only through Christ Jesus. It's only through whom? So all things are of God. Who has what? Reconciled us to himself by Christ. So how are we reconciled to God? By Christ Jesus. Who reconciled? God himself reconciles us to himself by the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. That's good stuff. Now look what he says. To wit, how does it happen? To wit, that God was what? In Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we have now this recognition that it was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So the sacrifice that Christ made, it was God in Christ doing a work to bring us back to him. This is why we understand that the work of salvation is a work of God. But we have to do what? Believe. We have to accept it. We have to understand. We also have, brothers and sisters, through the sacrifice of Christ, this eternal hope. We have everlasting life. We have eternal hope. How many of you want to live only after this life? You find everything should be done. How many of you all find this life 70, 80, 90, 100 years, things done, full stop? There's an eternal hope that we have, that life goes on. That all that we have, brothers and sisters, is more than just this life. Look what 1 John 5, 4, um, 1 John 5, 11 to 12. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life. And this life is where? In his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. 
So we recognize, brothers and sisters, that the life that we live, this eternal hope we have, is only in Christ Jesus. When you look at John chapter 6, and you don't have to go to us to, with it now, but when you look at John chapter 6, we were on that, and in verse, uh, in verse 38, 39, and 44, you realize that Jesus, in that, he was talking, when he was talking about the will of the Father, and he says that, that the will of the Father is for them to believe in him, yes, and he, what he's going to do, he is going to raise them up on the last day. There is a promise, brothers and sisters, this eternal hope that Christ is going to ra raise us up. Christ is going to come again. Many people, brothers and sisters, don't believe that Christ is coming again. He is coming again. And when he's coming, he's going to, we are going to see the effect of our redemption really being played off. Look what he says. And this is the record that God had given us what? Eternal life. And this eternal life, this life is where? In his son. We cannot have the eternal life except through his son because his son is the one who's coming to bring the deliverance of that eternal life. So we realize, brothers and sisters, that the work is being done. It has been done by Christ Jesus. And what we realize is that Christ worked so that I don't have to work. <laughs> He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My work, brothers and sisters, is not to work for my salvation, but I have to work out my salvation. What is the work then that I have to do? Remember we talk about the fact that there is a doing of the will of God. That's what we're talking about, not so? There's a doing of the will of God. And so what then is the work that I must do to be in the will of God? Jesus was asked that same question. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What must I do that I will work the works of God? John 6, 28 and 29. What must, that's a very important question, not so? What must I do? What's the answer to that question? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that he believe on him whom he hath sent. Our work, brothers and sisters, is to believe. We have to believe. We have to accept by faith the person of Christ Jesus, the message of Christ Jesus, and we have to accept the work of Christ Jesus. We must believe that this work that was done is a work that is final in his work. The, Christ, the work of Christ, Christ's work has had a redemptive purpose. Christ's work was, his death was a substitutionary death. And because of the sacrifice of Christ, we are reconciled to God. And through Christ, we have this eternal hope. That's what we believe about the work of Christ Jesus. And, as, and we have been accepting so far the person of Christ Jesus, the teachings of Christ Jesus, and the finished work of Christ Jesus. If we believe, brothers and sisters, that what Christ has done, he has done for me, then we are in the kingdom of God. Amen. Then we will be doing the will of God. Amen. God requires us to believe. What does he require you to do? Believe. To accept Christ. So when we accept Christ, that's the first step of us being able to enter into the will of God. What must we do in order to fulfill the will of God? We must accept Christ. Accepting Christ is believing in him, believing the person, believing his message, and believing his finished work. All that we have, brothers and sisters, is to accept Christ. Next day, we're going to look at the next point, which is to repent of our sins, because we're still looking at what must we do to fulfill the will of God. Amen? Amen.